Good morning. I pray that you're all well this morning. I know that none of us ever took our opportunity to meet together for granted, but I have gained a new appreciation of the blessing of being together. And uh, I hope soon we'll be able to do that. I'm going to ask something of you this morning before we get started. Every week when the elders get to get, get the opportunity to speak together, what's on our hearts and our minds is the welfare of this congregation. When do we get back together? How do we do that? What is the best thing to do in regard to those things? Those thoughts rarely, even during the week, leave our mind. One of the things we always pray for is wisdom. It is always included in our prayer. And I'm going to ask you to join us or continue to pray for wisdom for us in regard to making the decisions that we make for this family. How best to serve the Lord, how best to serve and be a blessing to the family there at Las Casas. As always, we covet your prayers. I've chosen a verse this morning out of Psalms. It's uh, Psalm 40. I'm going to just read the first couple of verses, but I encourage you to go ahead and read the rest of the chapter uh, throughout the day. Psalm verse 40. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. One of the greatest evidences of a deep and abiding faith is a peace and an inner calmness, even when things are not going exactly the way that we had hoped for. You've heard Chuck say this before, that great sailors are not made on flat water. Great sailors are made on rough seas. And you could consider, I guess, what is going on in the country and going on with us, some pretty rough seas, maybe even a testing of our faith. My encouragement to you is to be strong and to be courageous. Put your trust and take your strength in the Lord God Almighty and be joyful. It will be a blessing to you, a blessing to a family, your family, and a blessing to all those around you. And be praise to our God. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, we bow before you this morning, gives thanks for the life and for the blessing of this day. Father, we acknowledge your goodness and your mercy toward us each day. Father, you are our creator. You are our sustainer. Our trust, our hope, our confidence, and our faith, Father, is in you, and you are worthy of praise and glory. Father, we are thankful that we can bow before you and give thanks and let you know the things that are on our mind. Father, we pray for our loved ones who are hurting. Father, for all those who are experiencing trouble, Father, we ask your blessings of comfort upon them. Father, for those who are Harvey, Father, we especially pray for him, ask your blessings of comfort upon him. Father, we pray for everyone at the family at Las Casas. We pray that you would continue to bless us, continue to watch over us, give us strength, Father. We pray for our country. We pray for those who are working, Father, who are putting their efforts toward helping in this time of crisis. We ask your blessings upon them and, and to keep them safe. We pray for the leadership, Father, that you would bless them with wise decisions. Father, we pray for ourselves that you would bless us all with wisdom at best how to serve you. Father, again, we're thankful for the day. We're thankful for your abundant kindness on us each day. It is in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Good morning and welcome to our services this morning. We're glad you could join us and we're happy to have you with us this morning. This morning we're going to spend some time talking about the race of endurance. You know, in the New Testament there are several accounts where it talks about the similarities between the race of a physical race and that of our spiritual race, of the time that we're here as believers and the time that we claim our prize. I want to read a few of those scriptures to you this morning. So if you have your Bibles, the first place we're going to go this morning is 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Paul there says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives a prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize exercises self-control in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body, and I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others I myself should become disqualified. Our next Opening comes from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Paul there, as he talks to the young evangelist Timothy, he says in verse 5, And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. And then we'll go over to Hebrews chapter 12. And in Hebrews chapter 12, we'll... We'll read verses 1 through 3. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. This morning we want to talk about the race of endurance. And as we talk about the race of endurance, we're going to first of all look at it from the physical side, from an actual race, as you prepare to run a two-mile, four-mile, or a marathon race. One of the first things that happens is you have to have the desire to want to run that race and to start, to start with. Uh, I, I ran track, some in high school and some in college. And I remember being back in high school and like when you were playing football in the offseason, you had to play a sport. You either had to play baseball or you had to run track. Some of the guys uh, didn't want to play baseball, so they were drafted to run track. And if they, if they drafted you, if the coach drafted you to run track, a lot of times he would designate you to run a particular race, and you could tell they had no desire to run that race. They didn't do well in it. They didn't exert any energy to do that because they didn't like running in the first place. But the guys that came out for the track team that wanted to run and wanted to do well usually did well because they wanted to be there. So the first thing that has to happen in a physical race is the idea that you have, to, you have to desire to want to run that race. And then the next thing that happens in that is you have to have the knowledge of the rules. If you're going to run the one mile, the two mile, or you're going to run a marathon, there needs to be a knowledge of the rules. Where do you start? How many laps do you run? How far do you go? Uh, what, what is the route? If you're running a marathon, where are you going to finish? Are there going to be any inclines uh, in, in the race that you're running? Uh, you have to know if there's runner interference, what happens with that. You have to know the rules of the race in order to compete. So you want to be, you want to have the desire, you want to have the knowledge of the rules, and one of the next things is you're preparing for your race is the idea you want to set goals for yourself. You want to set goals for yourself. You're preparing for that race. And let's say, let's say we decided to run the marathon. And as we run the marathon, where do we want to be after one month of training? And what, what do we want our times to be? 
Where do we want to be after six months of training? And what do we want to do to achieve the things that we've set in that six months time period? And what happens after a year? Where do we want to be in a year? What, what times do we want to try to achieve? What are our goals? Without the goals in your physical race, you'll probably never get any better than you are. You have to set goals. Once you've achieved one time, then you're gonna, your workout is going to take you to achieve better times. And you do that every time that you run your race. You want to get better at your race so you're setting goals so that you can become better in your race. Uh, one of the things that happens in a, a physical race is the idea of proper diet. You know, it's been a long time since uh, I've run any track or any long distance to speak of whatsoever. So I remember back when we were in college, we were put on a, uh, a physical diet of, of different kind of proteins and things to help us and to enhance our running. And as I look at some things on the Internet, it talks about carbohydrates and getting rid of the fats, not as many fats and proteins and things of that nature. And as I was looking, there have probably been books written on your diet as you're preparing for your race. Uh, I was reading through Runner's World as I was preparing for the lesson. I was looking, there's, as you're training, there is a diet. Uh, ten weeks before your race, there is a diet for you. The day before your race, there is a particular diet for you. The night before your race, there is a particular diet. The morning of your race, there is a particular diet. And all these different foods that everybody says, this is good, this is what you need to be taking. And as soon as you get through with your race, there's also food to eat after your race. Your diet in a physical race is crucial uh, from all the reading that I've read with, in Runner's World that in order to achieve good times, and to do better that you have this particular diet that you've got to be taking of at that point. So diet is something that's very important. Uh, the next thing you think about as you're thinking about running your physical race is that you have to be disciplined to run. Once you've made up your mind that I want to run a marathon, and we're not just playing around, we're not just running, you know, a few miles to, to say we've run it. We actually want to run this race, and we want to do well with that race then we have there's something that happens as far as the discipline what happens is every morning we're going to look down at our shoes and it's time to run the rain the sleet the snow the hot the cold the mornings of I just really don't want to run this morning we got to be disciplined with that in order to achieve our goals to be better in that physical race in order to to set a time that we're trying to get to in our marathon, then we've, we've got to be disciplined. There's going to be the diet that we're eating. Everybody else is, they're eating things that maybe we like, and we're eating things that we don't like, but we're doing that because we want to cross that finish line, and we want to have a good time with that. And there's going to be times that we are, are wanting to go run that we just say, I just really don't want to run today. Or our friends are going to invite us and say, hey, Chuck, let's go play a game of golf, which is probably not going to happen since I don't play much golf. But they're going to say, let's go play, let's go play a round of golf. And i got to say, i got to go run. Or it may be that uh, I just like to come home in the afternoon. I'd like to just sit down on the couch. I'd like to just watch a good movie. Or I'd just like to go to sleep on the couch. And if I'm disciplining myself to run this marathon, then because of the goals that I've set, then I can't do that. There's going to be all these things that are going to be attracting me, and I, I, I can't do those things because I have set a goal that I want to finish the race with a good time, and I want to do well with that. As you think about running the physical race, it's the idea of your training partners. Uh, I can remember being back in college. We would pair up, and then we'd run in groups, and the reason for that a lot of times was to, to make sure that each one of us did our workout that was scheduled for us to work out with. But you always really wanted to try to find somebody that was better than you to do your workouts with because that person, they were a little stronger, a little faster than you were, and you had to try to keep up. And in doing that, it made you a better runner. And you're looking for that runner that's going to help you or a group of runners 
uh, as you're together they're encouraging you and helping you to be a better runner there's also going to be a time that with you you may be a better runner and you've got another guy with you and there's going to be a time in your race he may be a better starter in the marathon he may do that first 10 or 15 miles a little, little bit faster clip than you do and you and you end a little bit faster so as you train with him you're learning to get the start of that race in a little bit better shape before you go into the second part of that but it's crucial to have good people around you it's good to, it's good to have good people with you that you're that are, that are friends of yours and understand you you can't go play golf today that you're you're in a training regiment because you want to be successful in the race that you're in there's a, there's a lot of things to be thinking about as you think about a physical race. And then there comes a thing in a race, especially a marathon, and what we call a wall, where you hit a wall. Uh, it's going to come a time maybe around 18, 19, 20 miles into the race to where your body's starting to give out. You're, men you're fatigued physically. You're, you're fatigued mentally. And you just really want to stop at that point because you feel like you really can't go any further and that's that wall that you hit and a lot of research has been done on trying to hit and overcome a wall you know as I start thinking about a wall in the in the early 50s uh, it was thought that no man could ever break a four-minute mile that it was impossible that a man physically physically could not run a mile any faster then four minutes couldn't be done. Well, in May 6th, 1954, a guy by the name of Roger, Roger Bannister, he broke the first four-minute mile. And what's interesting about that is that not long after that, somebody broke the four-minute mile right after him because mentally it, it had been said you cannot break a four-minute mile. And once they broke that, then there's been many runners that have broken the four-minute mile since because they thought it was physically and mentally impossible but after it was broken then a lot of people said well yes we can do it as he talked about what he had to do in order, order to train to break the four minute mile you got people all around you saying it's physically impossible for you to break a four minute mile you can't do it and in his mind every time that he ran every time that he trained he visualized in his mind yes I can I can break this four-minute mile. He envisualized himself as he ran his race crossing the finish line in under four minutes. And that's exactly what he did. There's been a lot of study on how to break a wall. Now, a, lot of it, a lot of it is physical. You're, you're, you're training, you're disciplining your body, you're doing everything that you can, you're setting goals in order that when you get to that, whatever that wall is, whether it's at 12 miles or 16 or, or it's at 20 to where you physically hit this wall to where you think you can't go any further, then you do physical workouts. You do a lot of different workouts on inclines or whatever it may be to get you to where you can go through that wall. But in most of the studies that's been done, it's been determined that the mind is the limiting factor. The mind is a limiting factor. Your body, may be get, you, your body is getting fatigued, but a lot of time your, your mind is giving out with you. and Your mind is telling you you can't go any further. And there's uh, a practice that is done a lot of times among long distance runners where, where you talk to yourself. And they found out that talking to yourself in the second person is a good way to make it through the wall. You're, you're telling yourself, you can do this. You can make it through this. You know you can go up this hill. You know you can finish. You know you can do this. And it's the idea of talking to yourself. But a lot of the things that keep keeps a runner from breaking a physical wall one of the biggest things is the fact that mentally you don't think you can do it so you train your mind along with the physical part in order to break that wall and these are these are some of the things that we're talking about with a physical race um, a long race a marathon race so what I want to talk about now is because the Bible has, has given an analogy of the physical race and it talks about the spiritual race when you become a believer then you're entering into this race of endurance it's not a sprint 
It's not something that you come out of, out, out of the blocks in in a 100 meter or 200 meter or 400 meter. It's, it's a race that you start standing up and it is a race that you want to finish standing up with. And it's a race of endurance. As you think about the spiritual race of endurance, then it gets back to the same thing. A person has to desire to enter into the spiritual race of endurance. You have to decide whether you want to be a child of God. You can't let somebody, you know, coerce you into that or make you do that. It's something you need to do or you'll be just like the guy, just like the football player back in high school that was made to run a race and you run it and you really don't want to be there. The first thing that happens hap that has to happen in a spiritual race is the idea, I want to be in this race. I want to be a child of God and I want to finish and I want to claim the prize, and that is the new heavens and the new earth. I want that. So having that in your mind, that I want and I desire to be in this race, and it gets back to the same thing. What are going to be the rules of the race? Now that I've become a child of God, then what are the rules? And that's the reason God has his word. So you can read in there and find out the things that you can do, the things that you can't do. And all the, the tools that are given to you in order to complete the race. So it's the idea that you're reading God's word in order to ascertain what are the things that I need to know in order to run the race. Uh, the next thing with this, just like it is in a physical race, is the idea that you need to set goals. If you don't set goals in a physical race, Odds are that wherever you started, that time's not going to get much better. In fact, it's going to get probably, excuse me, a little bit worse at that point. And the same thing happens with your spiritual race. And I think it's something that we miss a lot is that we have to set goals for ourselves. When we, when, we, when we become believers and we start our race and we desire our race and now we know what the rules of the race are, then we've got to set our goals. Where do we want to be? When we came out of the water grave of baptism in a month, where do we want to be in six months? Where do we want to be in a year? Where do we want to be at five years down the road? Do I desire to be a deacon? Do I desire to be a teacher? Do I desire to be an elder? What are my goals? We've got to grow, and the Bible talks about this. We have to mature in the Word. We have to mature as Christians, just like the runner has to set goals for himself in order to get better you and your spiritual race are going to have to set goals in order to become more spiritually mature. The next thing, just like in the physical race, your diet, your diet is of the utmost importance in your spiritual race. And part of that diet is the fact that you are studying God's Word. Now, you've read it to know what the rules are, but reading is one thing, studying it. And feeding yourself is another thing altogether. We're spending a lot of time, just as there have been books written on a physical diet in order to run your physical race, we have a book that's been written for us in order to run a great spiritual race. And we're feeding ourselves every morning during the day Remember we talked about the physical race. They were feeding themselves well before into the training, 10 days before the day of, the day after, the time of the race. You're, you're feeding yourself every day because if you don't feed yourself the proper nourishment for a physical race, you will fail. If you don't feed yourself the proper nourishment for a spiritual race, then you will fail. We talked about being disciplined in the physical race. And you have to be disciplined in the spiritual race. There are things you can't do. The children of Israel had gotten to the promised land. And when they got to the promised land, they sent the 12 spies in. Ten came back and said, there's no way we can take it. Joshua and Caleb came back and said, yes, we can take it. God has brought us here. We can take it. The ten cried all night long. God said, because of your lack of faith, those that are 20 years and older, you're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And those 19 and younger are going to be the ones that are going to enter into the promised land along with Joshua. 
and along with uh, Caleb, you're going to go into there, but those 20 years and older are not going to go there. And now this, they've wandered for 40 years, and now this group is getting ready, to go in, getting ready to go into the promised land once again. And God comes to Joshua, and he says to him in Joshua chapter 1, he says, do not be dismayed. Do not have a lack of courage. But when you get ready to go into the land, do not turn to the right. Do not turn to the left. Meditate on the word both day and night. You're feeding yourself. And keep your eye on where I'm sending you. And you will be victorious. And it's a matter of being disciplined. We're running our race and we're not getting distracted with things off to the right. We're not getting distracted with things off to the left because we are running a disciplined race and a disciplined routine in order to achieve that race. There are going to be things that we can't do. We're going to be watching our friends doing things and we're going to think, well, I wish I could do that. But just like in a physical race, with this spiritual race, there are going to be things that we can't do. And we're going to learn to work our way through that. We have a new way of thinking as we become a, a new creature in Christ. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3 talks about it. So you were taught to develop a new way of thinking. You were taught to be clothed with a personality like that of God. It was created with true righteousness and holiness. We, we, we've got this whole different facade around ourselves and we are disciplined. We are taking on the mind and the thoughts of what God wants us to have. We're very disciplined in the way that we run our race. Just like you need good partners in order to run your physical race, you need good partners around you to run your spiritual race. It's important that you keep people around you that help, you make, that help make you better. You want to keep good friends around you that encourage you. The Hebrew author talks about it. When we get together, we're there to stir each other up to love and good works. And you want to keep the closest friends around you, those people that are going to sharpen you, they're going to help make you better. As young people, I encourage you, it is, it is, it's imperative that you're dating people that are going to help you be better as a believer, that are going to help you finish the race strong. You want to marry people that are going to help you finish this race strong, that are going to encourage you, that are going to help you. You want to be with the brothers and sisters in Christ as we, as we fellowship together to help it, it, on this like this buddy system that we're helping to encourage each other up and we're building each other up so that we can finish the race strong. And then we get to the point where it talks about breaking through the walls. You know, there, there, are, walls, there are walls in our spiritual race. There are going to be storms that we're going to go through in our spiritual race. There are going to be times to when we're physically exhausted. There are going to be times when we're emotionally exhausted, either through the weight of sin or through the weight of the world or of the different things that can happen to us, and we're going to get to that, that point in our spiritual race just like it happens with the physical race when they hit that 20-mile marker and everything's starting to break down, and you're thinking, it is impossible for me to go any further. I cannot go any further. I physically cannot make it. And we've all been through those things, just like the runner as he tries to break that wall. And as you think about that, it's the aspect of as a believer trying to break through that wall to go through that storm, he doesn't, he doesn't leave us there like the runner. The runner has to say to himself, you can make it, you can do this. He's talking to himself in the second person. God says, I'm with you. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I've, I've got in Ephesians chapter 1, I have every spiritual blessing known through Christ Jesus to help, me, to help me run this race. I have God's word. I have God's spirit. I have the avenue that I can go to him in prayer. I have the blood of Jesus Christ. I have my brothers and sisters in Christ. I have all these different tools that are going to help me get through this storm to when I get physically and I get emotionally drained and I feel like I cannot go any further then God's going to help us make it through that. He didn't say it was going to be easy. We have to go through the storms. He said, you count it all a joy. James chapter 1 says, you count it all a joy when you fall into various trials and temptations. When you fall into those things, you, you count it a joy. And that's what we do. We make it through those things. Just like the physical runner can make it through it, we can go through the spiritual race 
And we have so many more tools available for us to make it through that. So as we think about this analogy of the, of the physical race and the spiritual race, then my, my prayer for us is that we take note of some of these things and that we work on our spiritual race. Let's look at our race that we're in. From the time we become a believer to the time we cross the finish line and we claim eternity, we're going to go through a lot of the same things that a physical runner goes through. One of the things that we cannot do is run our race weight it down. Hebrews chapter 12 talks about that. The Hebrew author says, you've got to throw off every weight of sin off of you. Can you imagine trying to run a marathon race with a 70 pound, back, 70 pound pack on your back? You can't do that. It would be almost physically impossible for you to finish that race well with that pack on your back. You're training all this time and you, then you step up to the starting line and you throw a pack on your back. There's a lot of us that are trying to run the spiritual race that are weighted down by sin. And that should not be that way. We have freedom in Christ Jesus. We have freedom through the blood of the Lamb. And that comes through the fact that we confess our sins one to another and we shall be healed and that sin will be lifted. If we want to turn from that, then God takes that weight off, off of us. And every day that we wake up, we should have freedom in Christ Jesus and we should be throwing off every weight of sin. And if we throw off every weight of sin, we're going we're to see the finish line in sight and we're going to cross into the new heavens and the new earth and into the promise. I want to go over to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And as Paul was at the end of his life, he wrote this to Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. And remember these words because this is what it's all about. This is what we are doing. I have fought the good fight, he says. I have finished the race and I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. We are here living in our temporary tent. And we're here running the race every day, going through being disciplined and watching our diet and all the things that we're doing so that one day we can cross the finish line. And we're, we're entering over into our rest and we are obtaining the prize and the prize is eternal life. And it means we're different. We're like the runner. As he, as he is separate from everybody else around him trying to win that race, that's exactly our mentality. And I pray for you. I pray that you have the mentality that we keep focused on Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of the race, and that we can claim our prize, which is eternity. If, if you're having trouble with your race and you find yourself weighted down, there's some, there's some numbers at the end of our broadcast today, and if you would call those numbers, we'd be glad to pray for you. We want you to throw off that sin. And brothers and sisters, I pray that, that your week coming up here will be a blessed week and you run your race strong. And you run it knowing that the prize is there for you. Hope you have a blessed day. Hope you have a blessed week. And may everything that you do be for the glory of God and for Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining us. You call me out upon the waters, the great
the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope, who could and minds today to partake of the Lord's Supper. I'll be reading some scripture with you. If you'd like to follow along with me, I'll be starting in John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. 
that was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now if you'll turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Let's, pl let's pray for the bread. Heavenly Father, we bow before you, Father, and we thank you for every blessing of life, Father. Father, we thank you for watching over us, Father, for caring for us, for loving us. Father, we thank you for Jesus and that your plan, you knew, Father, that uh, this world was not complete without him, Father, and we thank you for his willingness that he would empty himself and come to this earth, Father, and that through his death and through his burial and through his resurrection that we have that redemption, Father. Father, as we partake of this bread, we realize it represents that body of Jesus, Father. Help us to clear our minds of all thoughts and interest and focus on Jesus and, Father, his willingness to go to that cross for us. Father, help us to take this bread in a worthy manner. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's pray for the cup also. Heavenly Father, we continue our thanks, and Father, we are just thankful for Jesus. Father, and again, that uh, that he was willing. Father, that he, he left the home with you, Father, and he came to this earth. Father, that he felt pain like we do, and that he was willing to go to that cross, Father, and that he was willing to suffer for us. Father, we realize that as we take of this cup, it represents the blood that he shed for us, Father, and we pray that we will partake of it in a worthy manner. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I'm gonna trade my earthly home for a better one, bright and fair. Christ left to prepare a mansion for his children in the air. I'll join him in that land where tears, no sorrow can be found. And I'll receive my mansion, mansion, robe, robe and crown. The weather there is always fair, there is sunshine day and night. No cold and no rain will fall there, for the sun shines ever bright. I'll need no heavy garments, I'll just wrap my robe around. When I receive my mansion, mansion, robe, robe and crown. Mansion, mansion, robe, and a crown oh, There love, love, love always abound Let me your throne surround Lord, please reserve my mansion Mansion, robe, robe and crown My head is bowed and bloody now From the work I've tried to do But one day I'll be rewarded With a crown so bright and new I'll wear a smile so bright, for there'll be no cause for a frown. When I receive my mansion, mansion, robe, robe and crown, I'm on a mansion, 
Mansion, robe, robe and crown. I want a mansion. mansion, robe and a crown. And glory, there love, and love, always a vow. Forever lay and me, your throne surround. Lord, please reserve my mansion. Mansion, robe, robe and crown. Before we close in prayer, we want to tell everyone thank you uh, for joining us. We know how excited everybody is to get back together. I know we are at our house. If you will, bow with me. Father God in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And Father, right now we say a special prayer. Father, for those that are hurt and struggling. Father, financially, with their health. For those in our community, around the world. Father, we, we know that you are the great physician. And Father, that everything is in your hands. So Father, for that, we pray, your, we pray your blessing. Father, for your son, for his sacrifice. Father, for our opportunity to be in heaven with you. We give you thanks. And it's all in his name. Amen.